This is Grover Dale, and you're listening to the Studio Success Formula Podcast. Well, welcome to the Studio Success Formula Podcast, the business school for dance studio owners. And now for your host, Clint Salter. Hi, dance studio owners. It's Clint Salter from Studio Success Formula, and thank you for joining us. I'm thrilled to be bringing you someone extremely special to the dance world on the show today. From heading to New York City in 1953 with $130 in his pocket, with a dream to making it on Broadway, to being in the cast of the original company for West Side Story, to launching the go-to website for dancers across the globe, AnswersForDancers.com. Our guest today lives and breathes dance. He's passionate about educating dancers, and today his story, knowledge, and wisdom will certainly give you some insights and ideas on how you can really take your studio and students to the next level. Please welcome our guest on the show today, Grover Dale. Hello, Grover. Yeah, hi, Clint. It's great to talk with you. Yeah, it's it's awesome to connect with you. And I mean, I connected with you quite a few years ago when I first reached out to you. It was about it was about eight years ago, and I just started dance life here in Australia. And I really loved what you were doing with Answers for Dancers. So I think that's a really great place for us to start. Can you tell us oh, a good. little? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the website and why you started it? Well. Um the truth is, um, I'm, by nature, I'm a risk taker, uh, both with my work and the way I live my life. You know, stepping on on the skinny branches, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm pretty fearless about it. And truth is, it happens in every dance class. Every dancer is stepping out on the skinny branches if you want to get something out of the class. Mm. So in a way, you and I are used to it because we grew up in the studio environment. We knew... We knew what it was like. So when we don't even realize what we're building, even as we're building it, we just keep building it. So the, the truth is, if someone had told me that back in the day that the minute, that four years after I got on that bus with $130 in my pocket, I was going to be in the classic Broadway musical West Side Story in the original company, I wouldn't have believed it. And 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 then in a way the same thing is true. Uh, if someone had told me 15 years ago that Answers for Dancers was destined to become the world's number one website for educating dancers about the biz, I wouldn't have believed it. You know, so my nature is just to do the work. You know, and I enjoy the work. It it's. It rewards me in a way that uh, nothing ever has before, and I'm having a Clint. I'm having a ball with it. It's great. It's fantastic. Let's go back. Uh, I want to ask you a question because you know you did. I mentioned in the intro, and you just talked about it again. Then you know you got on a bus with 130 dollars to essentially you know go and make it on Broadway, and you were cast in West Side Story. What do you think were the qualities you possessed as a as a human being, as a dancer, as a performer that landed you that job? And do you think those same <laughs> qualities get um, you know get people booked today? Is is there some kind of relationship there? Do you think it's such an interesting question? You know, because yeah, uh, back in those days, I didn't know what I had to offer. I just I just threw it out. I I. I recognized years later that I had uh, a brand of enthusiasm that was that was intense, you know. And walking into auditions to was and hearing the music was just another opportunity to <laughs> express myself and allow what I had inside me to come out. Mm. Um, no one had told me about how important it is to be present in the room, to put your energy in the room. I just did it. I mean, uh, you know, um, when you go, uh, I, I would liken that to like, if you go into a subway station and you look at the platform on the other side, and suddenly your eyes are drawn to someone who just walks in. They have an energy about them. Mm-hmm. They have, uh, you know, so they get your attention. And the same thing is true about auditions. So that you walk in. I, I, I'm telling you, I think I walked in 
not to get something. It wasn't about, I, I did, I wasn't worried about paying the rent. I wasn't worried about losing the job. I just wanted to dance. And it was just another opportunity to do it and to give it away. You know, I, t- today that's what I suggest to dancers to, uh, avoid walking in feeling needy and you need to because you're going to get something out of it no matter what but just go in there to give it away Mm, i love that i think that's really that that's really around the mindset you know it's 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 got nothing to do with the talent because so many people uh and i know you know having worked with lots of dancers but talking obviously to all of our dance studio owners who have students that are going for auditions that so many times though that they actually they actually need that job they go into that job um with with a with a hint i guess of of desperation because they do need to pay the rent you know otherwise they're gonna have to go and work otherwise they're gonna have to go and work maybe in retail or a coffee shop um and so how do you how do you kind of help them around you know switching the mentality when they're going into that audition it belongs to a very special group of people, and some people have it by instinct, but it can also be acquired. Uh, it's like in, in the dance studio that I grew up in, Lillian Jasper's dance studio in McKe- McKeesport, Pennsylvania, she had a way of encouraging me and that I, I trusted when I look at pictures, I go through my scrapbook and see pictures back in those days, I see it written all over her body. And she was a very large woman. And I thought, oh, that's where I got it. This picture of Lillian, she's loving dance. She's she's eating it up. And I didn't know that. It wasn't put to me, it wasn't put out to me in words, but I eventually I recognized it and I see what she gave me. Speaking of dance studios, you and I have a lot in common. Uh, you started a dance studio when you were 16, right? Did. And you started one at 15, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> you know, and w- w- when I think about that, now I recognize w- w- what I needed when I started that school, I needed product. I needed product to teach. So, but what was surprising was the benefits that I got from getting product really helped me in getting my career started because I, I would go to different conventions in different cities in Pittsburgh and Youngstown and in Wheeling, West Virginia. And back in those days, they taught a full routine in one hour. There was no uh, DVDs. There was no way to take it with you on in a recorded form. You had to memorize it, and you had to be able to, to do it within an hour. So during the day, there would be six routines thought, and I made sure that I could go back to my hometown after those conventions and start teaching those different those different routines. Mm. So. When I went to New York, that was that was what you you need to be able to pick up really fast. You need to be able to learn it fast, and you need to be able to retain it and to change it if they want you to change it. So those were two fundamental skills that I got just from starting my own dance studio. Yeah, I love I love that, and that's that's such an important um, skill. That, that you picked up from running your dance studio for then when you went to go on to become a professional performer. Yes, exactly, exactly. And the demand has even gotten more intense today because the, the, our business, the industry is run by economics and every producer, every employer wants to, wants to deliver more for less amount of money, for the least amount of money. And uh, I totally understand why they want to do it, but the pressure that that applies to the person walking in, the newcomer who wants to get a job, you have to be ready for that circumstance. So 
It's not about the job you're auditioning for tomorrow. It's when you walk in, you want to make an impression and you want to make yourself valuable during that audition so that they remember you for the job that they're going to do six months from now or a year from now. You can do that. Mm. Um, So on that topic, I mean, what are some of the things, most of the people that are listening today are studio owners or or dance teachers, and we do have, you know, dance students as well that that listen to some of the particular interviews, but what are some things that they can do in an interview to ensure that they're remembered, that they stay top of mind? You know, every audition is different, and every choreographer is different, so... You, there is no formula that's going to work at every audition. But if you are part of your training is just to walk into the room w- with enthusiasm and, again, w- with the idea of giving away what you have and delivering your best, you win every single time, whether you book the job or not, because you never know where the next opportunity is going to come from. Mm. And and believe me, they are out there. Uh, I did an audition uh, when I co-directed Jerome Robbins' Broadway, and I was seeing hundreds of dancers every week. And one day I was auditioning, and this dancer came over to the table and handed my assistant a note and said, please give this to Grover. And he walked away, And I looked at her and she says, here's the note. And I opened it up and it said, I love to dance. And I couldn't help but to watch him because I was, he stimulated my curiosity. Mm. I was curious about what, if what he was saying was true and he was telling the truth. He loved to dance. He ultimately didn't get that job, but I recommended him for another job that he did get. So he found he found a way to communicate directly with me. And that doesn't mean you should walk in and try <laughs> to get a note into the hands of the choreographer. But, you know, again, it's tapping into your creativity. It's part of the, it's part of the job. It's part of the arena to make an impression. And... You know, you have to, sometimes you have to be careful about how aggressive you are with that. You have to tune in to what the vibe is in the room and what the people are like. Uh, but it's it's an open book. You, you can make things happen on your own, uh, which is another thing I would love to talk to you about because there are young people who are trailblazers out there and who are coming up with really creative ideas on how they can market themselves Mm. and marketing yourself is really important today. Um, you know, with the, uh, and it's going to change, you know, it's like five years ago, Facebook wasn't the same thing it is today. And, but there are, people who are using it. There are people who are using their iPhones to shoot video of themselves and to edit demo reels so that they are putting together a product that appeals to people. Um, Like there's a girl that I work with. Her name is Emmy, and she made a demo reel. And it's a strong demo reel, uh, dance-wise. But she created the music track, but along with that music track, she talked about herself and talked about her feeling and her romance with dance. So that is on her demo reel. I've never seen a demo reel like that, Mm. you know? So she, she's found a way to not only show her dancing skills, but to show the viewer what, how she feels about her craft. Uh, so I really admire her for doing that. Yeah. And that's, and that's a great idea. And you've touched on a great, a great aspect, aspect there of being a performer or a dancer is you've got to treat it as a business. You know, you, yes, absolutely. you, you are running your absolutely. own business and you are the main asset in that business. Right. Yeah. You do it all. You step on the gas, you navigate the curse in the road and you, you create the roadmap that's going to get you there. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the ball's in your court. 
you know, you, you, you are running a business. Mm. And do you see, look, do you see a lot of dancers that, that are not running themselves at a business? They might be highly talented. They could be the best dancer in the room, but, but they're not the one that's getting booked because they either haven't marketed themselves or they, they, they haven't invested. What I find is they don't invest in building the relationships with people. Listen, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, that's true. It's sometimes it's not about being the best dancer in the room. It may be being the person who's really terrific at revealing who you are in the room, uh, what your energy is, what your personality is like, how easy you will be to work with. Will you be fun to work with? Will will you will you be helpful to the person standing next to you? All of that counts. Mm. And and I think it counts even more today in a highly competitive world. You know, everyone wants yes, to be a dancer. It, it does. It's a well. Yeah, we, we ran a survey last month about with our members about what they are. Uh, what they're doing, what really counts at auditions, like the, uh, how many auditions requested that you wear high heels? 46% last month. Uh, how many auditions were you asked to sing? 14% last month. How many, uh, how many auditions asked for ethnic types? 44%. You know, it's very interesting statistics are emerging. And as soon as I published those in the dance blast, um, an agent came forward, Julie McDonald at MSA, and she confirmed that, yes, there is an uptick in auditions. And then another agent came in, uh, Terry Lindholm, who addressed what you just addressed, saying that, look, there are more auditions. But what's happening is they're trimming back on the number of open calls. So what's happening is more and more employers want you to send them, sub submit your materials, your headshot, your resume, and your demo reel, and then they will call and invite you to an audition. Well, you know, that is, that's a game changer because suddenly fewer newcomers get to go to Big's Open Calls. Mm. And they have to come up with submission materials. So if I'm a studio owner and I spot some talent in the room, I'm going to tell them, listen, start using your camera, start editing some video and put your put your your routine together. Go out in go out to the park in a beautiful setting and shoot your dance out there. Go to the roof of a building shoot your your dance up there make it beautiful to look at and interesting to look at don't just shoot it in a rehearsal studio because that video is going to look like every other class video yeah that's it's so interesting it is it's a i think it's a really interesting time grover can you for our listeners that that don't know much or, or anything about answers for dancers can you give us a quick kind of overview of of what the site actually does well, you know, it started out um, to just help dancers get employed. But what it has, it has developed. I, I used to be what they called the answer guy. I'm not the answer guy. I, I'm. I merely created a platform that all these dancers get to come to, and they communicate with each other on the site. There's a uh, section of the site called I Dance Too, and it's interactive, and they share feedback with each other. They post their videos. They, crit they critique each other's videos. They help edit each other's videos. So, you know, as, when I hear the agents talking about how critical it is to that you have to pre-submit your materials, I think, oh my God, we've been doing this. We've been doing this for ages on Answers for Dancers. You know, it the platform is there to take advantage of. You can you can just use the site to get the, the next week's auditions, this week's auditions. Uh, this week there was fifty eight in nineteen different cities. Uh, some of them international. Uh, so it it's it's a real tool and. I mean, talk about affordability. You can pay $35,000 a year and go 
go to get a college uh, degree in dance, but you're not going to get today's information in a, any college that I know of. They're just there's no way they're in touch with what is going on in the industry today. Mm. Uh, but you can on answers for dancers for twenty two cents a day. You can you can have it all year. Yeah, exactly. It's a fantastic resource. I'm not championing it as a college education because there's nothing like being in the room with with an educator and uh, with other other students at the same time. This is an alternative way to really be in touch with what is going on right now. Yeah, it's it, it, it's great. Where the jobs are. Who, yeah. You know, and you know yourself, it's about the research you do and what agencies you're interested in, what choreographers you're interested in, so that when you go to the audition, you can, if you have a chance to speak with the choreographer, say, listen, I just, I just saw the video you choreographed last year and it's fantastic. Anytime you, you, you want someone to fill in, uh, I'll volunteer for any, any project you want to do. You know, it's it's know know who's out there, know who you want to work with, know, know who has the style that you really admire. Mm, great, great advice there. Now you just touched on on agents, and I want to ask you some of your thoughts on that because many of our dance studio owners would love some insight into the pros and cons of of dance agencies uh, and it'd be great to hear some of your tips as well on getting the right agent that they can pass on to their students. It's, it's very important to get the right agent, but nobody can pick that for you except you because the, the relationship, a successful relationship is, is one that you develop with the agent and choosing the agency, choose the agency you know, I, I know people who go on and look at the agency's websites and they make sure, find out who their clients are, who would, who the choreographers are that they work with. And if they match up with the choreographers they want, then they, they work to try to get to that agency. Um, you know, it's, again, it's having those survival instincts and, uh, uh, you know, survival instincts are are super important, and I I didn't know that. But growing up in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, I as a kid, I developed survival instincts. Like I, we just talked about, what you do to get to get uh, if you start a dancing school, what you do to get um, um, routines to teach. Well, there are you know I realized that. Big city survival is is not much different than small town survival. So, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, gave me a lot to work with when I went on that bus with one hundred and thirty dollars. So, the one hundred and thirty dollars lasted two months, but those instincts lasted me a lifetime. Mm. It's great. It's great. I love it. And so, we've got a lot of dance studio owners that that are listening today. And if they've got talent that, that want to have a successful career, I mean, what, what sort of messages, what should they be saying to these students? What do they need to know before they step into the big world of, of entertainment? You know, it, it encourage them to tap in, into their creativity. And, you know, again, it's creativity is something that isn't exclusive to geniuses. We all have it. You know, and dancers are by nature creative. We we just and encourage them to in in classes dedicate one class a month to freestyle, so that you, you teach them the routine. But say, okay, the next eight bars, I want you to freestyle, and you, that is an essential skill. Being feeling comfortable freestyling improvising, making it up as you go along. Gee, oh, there's so many important things that, that I, w- I would love to share about. As you're in, in class, congratulate yourself for the gains that you're making. Even every little 
little gain that you make adds to your confidence level. And that doesn't mean to be arrogant about it, but just to know you see, oh, I'm doing that. I'm getting stronger with that. And encourage your students to gain that kind of confidence. Um, uh, I, I met a young girl who's a model uh, two days ago, and she was, was extremely beautiful, but along with that, she had a common sense about her that I couldn't take my eyes off of. She was, she was like a buddy, uh, and uh, I was in a casting session yesterday, and I, I kept thinking about her, about casting her in, in this role, even though she, she can't she doesn't act and is not interested in acting, I thought, well, I could have someone behind her speaking the dialogue. But there was something about her that was so appealing. And choreographers like to discover new talent. So dancers should be aware of that. Just like I'm describing to you, I was I I was improvising in how I could cast that person. It's it's totally unrealistic today, but I dedicated several moments to figuring out how I could use that wonderful girl. Uh but th- that you never know when that's gonna happen. Yeah. So so true. So true. Um, I, I want to kind of rewind a little bit and talk a little bit about you growing up as a dancer because, you know, I, I have read your story and you talk about being bullied and bullying still exists today and it's something that dance studio owners are faced with within their studios, especially because of social media and the internet now. Bullying doesn't just stop when you come home from, you know, the dance studio it, it can continue. So what what advice do you have when it comes to dealing with bullying with, within a dance studio, you know, within their dance studio family? It's a, it's a, really, it's a really tough one for a lot of them. Yeah, yes, it is. And I, it was my dance teacher that saved my butt. Um, I was in high school. I was 14 years old. And I was getting teased by my classmates because I was a tap dancer. When it came time to re-enroll for the next season at the dance studio, I didn't re-enroll. And my teacher called me up and she said, Grover, how come you haven't re-enrolled? And I confided in her why I didn't. And she said, and she had, in two seconds, she had the right thing to say to me. She said, look, come to the school and I will pay you $9 a week, and you can help me teach. And back in those days, $9 was was like $75 today. Mm. So I I immediately accepted her offer, and it, that was that changed everything, even, even with my classmates, because suddenly I was making money. And she was showing me how to teach. I was an assistant first, and I was developing it. So, you know, she came to my rescue. But how do you come to your own rescue? Mm. Uh, I think bullying has, has evolved into more people are aware of it. And, uh, and that's a good thing. But, you know, it's... When you're a teenager, you're very vulnerable to, you need to belong, you want to belong, and if suddenly you're being criticized for wearing tap shoes. And, you know, two years later, I was known as Mr. Tap Toe, and I didn't mind at all, because by then I was making $30 a week. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so it it was, it gave me another another level of confidence in myself. Uh, I was well on my way even before I went to New York to seeing, recognizing that I could make a living dancing. Dancing could, could supply what my needs. Yeah. So, you, you know, again, teachers, you know, you, you have 
you have children who are there. And I know having a dance studio today is a different ball game. Back in my day, all I did was pay $5 a day for the use of the Elks ballroom. And, um, I didn't have to fill out license forms. I didn't have to do any of the kind of things that teachers have to do today to have a studio, uh, and insurance and all that. But the, you know, I have a lot of admiration for people who commit to teaching dance. Uh, that I know, I know, I know the arena from a lot of different angles. And um, so, you know, please, I, and I love that you're doing what you're doing, Clint, because that you that you can support studio owners in this way, and teachers in this way, and students in this way. That's remarkable. Thank please, you. Please uh, know that. Thank you. And it's, uh, you know, it, it was a very organic, um, you know, it was a very organic start. I had a few dance studios come to me saying, can you help me with my business? And, and that was, you know, quite a few years ago. And it's, it's just grown from there. And obviously having dance life as well and, and owning a uh, studio. Oh, so for you. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's worked, yeah. you know, it's working out very nicely. And we've got such a great, hungry, passionate group of dance studio owners that are part of our community that, you know, that want to run great businesses and impact more people, which is totally what I'm about and, and what you're about as well. Thank you. Thank you. We, we all belong together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we certainly do. Now you talked about, you know, you've seen the insides of, of lots of dance studios and you've seen lots of talent, um, you know, come out of dance studios. What do you think um, are some of the qualities uh, you believe is are the difference between having a great dance studio that has sustainability that produces great talent and then the dance studio that, that doesn't stay around for very long or might not ever reach that point of getting over, you know, 100 students. I mean, what do you see are the differences with those two types of dance studios? I wish I had a good answer for you, Clint. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I do. Um, it's, to, to me, dance is about passion and about uh, love for the human ability to use your body to express yourself. You know, keep expressing yourself because the whole world is watching. Uh, you know, and it's like, I want students to do that. I want the teachers to do that. And, oh, the other thing I, I did, the other thing I was looking for, for uh, advice for studio owners, put in jazz class, in hip hop class, ballet class, switch out the teachers so that students, your talented students, get a shot at different approaches to teaching the same subject mm. because that will help them at auditions. You know, I, I know dancers who have taken for years from the same jazz teacher and they have one style down, but as soon as they went into auditions, they realized, oh my God, I've never gotten near that style. You know, it's like, mix it up, throw in another teacher, throw in a substitute teacher. The easier said than done, right? But I think it's, you know, I think it's a really, I think it's a really, really important point. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of studios I've spoken to in the past, you know, and, and this doesn't have to be, you know, they said to me, oh, but I can't switch out, you know, that normal teacher. But there's so many options now for you to run master classes or workshops where yes. this might yes. be a particular class or a day, you know, uh, so over during summer when you've got summer camps. I mean, there, there are really a lot of opportunities for you to be able to bring in external teachers to continually grow your students. Because I, I had a conversation in an interview actually that came out this week with Kimberly Fitch and I was talking to her about going to my first audition when I was 17 and uh, mm -hmm. working with a mm -hmm. choreographer who I'd, uh, I'd never done a class with this person and I just couldn't pick up the choreography. Her style and the way that she taught was so different to what I was used to because I yes. only had, you know, like two teachers. So it's really important. It is. You're absolutely right. 
Absolutely right. Boy, we've covered a lot of territory here. Whoa. Yeah, look, it's 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 awesome. And this is what these interviews are about, uh, you know, action-packed, trying to get in as much uh, as we can to be able to pass on, you know, that to the studio owners to – and a lot of this stuff is really great for the dance student, you know, that that it is coming up through the ranks that wants, you know, that wants a career. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. and. Um, yeah, you, you know the. Uh, I know a lot of studios have computers in them now, uh, and to to show to to have a monthly get together where you uh, you show demo reels uh, and discuss them and and critique them and evaluate one with the other and what what do you like about this demo reel as opposed to that one and the same with headshots throw 24 headshots on the floor because that that's how uh producers choose their people for commercials they put the the headshots are all laid out which one pops which one jumps out at you and let dancers choose let dancers tell you which one pops and the, the connection that they will make oh that pops because of the energy behind our eyes, uh, you know, and it's just so many different different ways to uh, education of a dancer. Mm. I think that's great. I love those ideas. You know, and it's it's not just about dance steps. It's it's about it's about showing them that that it's about more than dance steps. You know, because your, your five pirouettes aren't going to get you the job because there are very few jobs where you have to do five pirouettes. In fact, often you don't even have to do two. It's about your energy. It's about your personality. It's about your fire. It's about the way you do the melt. It's the way, you, you know, it, it's your sass. It's your humor. Uh, all of that, all of that factors in. It sounds like, you know, and a lot of those things that you just described are what, are what makes you, you, and, and a lot of those things you can't, you can't, you don't have too much control over. Uh huh. Uh huh. No, you're, yeah, you're, you're, I think you're right. I think you're right. And it, you know, um, I look at, um, some videos like, uh, I I did the uh, first one years that Joe Layton choreographed uh, many years ago, and I I look at it and I see like a number that four dancers did with Florence Henderson, and we played waiters. But I saw the way we had adopted the style of a waiter, the elegance of the waiter, and the twinkle in the eye when she's singing at us. Uh, you know, and th- those are things that you bring to the table when you, you're cast. Uh, you're, that you're not necessarily asked to do that, but if you take those kind of chances, those kind of risks when you're performing, and if someone says, well, wait a minute, could you try this instead of that? Absolutely. You, you, you'll, you'll shift in a second. Or they'll say, oh, I, I, I like that. Do it like Grover's doing it. Uh, or do it like Johnny's doing it. You know, it's, it, it's a process of developing your performance levels. And it, it happens spontaneously. There isn't a formula um, there is in some classes, an acting teacher will teach you the method, but when you're in there actually choreographing and being choreographed upon, things come up and sometimes they're accidents. Sometimes you make a mistake and everybody falls on laughing and say, wait a minute. No, no, no. Let's do that. That, that works good. You, you know, it, it's, it's a gamble. Now I'm admitting that I'm a gambler, <laughs> but it, it's true. We, we are. We gamble with what we've got, and the more con- more confident we are, are in what we have, it freezes it up. It's like that girl that I wanted to cast in in, in the musical. She was just. I, 
I mean, I was grinning the whole time I was looking at her because she was so charming. And whatever she did, I would want to use it, you know? It, it's She had a gift. Yep. And that's what we, that's what, that's what we all look for in the rehearsal, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I want to kind of go back. You mentioned, you know, hard work, you know, at the, at the top of our conversation. What's your philosophy around hard work? Because I was having a conversation with a friend last night at dinner and, and we talk about how a lot of where you get to is due to the amount of work that you put in. Do you think that's the same thing? in this space for, for dancers, for studio owners? Yes. Talent is a terrible thing to waste, but it's a great thing to invest in. Mm, I love and that. And the, the, the investment is in, in your hands, how much you're willing to invest. But I'm, t- <laughs> I'm telling you, the competition is out there. And if you, if you want to compete, all competing and make it joyous and go for it. Yeah, and, and, and work hard. I think it's about putting, you know, putting both feet in the pond, you know, committing that, that you're going to do this because I see it with so many dancers and even with studio owners who maybe run their studio part-time and they've also got a full-time job. You know, I think sometimes it's scary and, and like you said, it's a risk, but you've got you've to go in there, you know, 110%. Yeah, yes, and to find a balance, um, I, I, I watched a class at Broadway Dance Center last month, and there, there was a young man dancing there who was trying to be like the teacher. And I, I said, are you trying to be more like him? And he said, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I said, you know what, just for now, switch it out. Don't try to be like him. Do it the way you would do it. And suddenly this whole new version of him emerged. And I said, that's good. You, 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 just, you just identified something in you that works just as good as what the teacher is doing. Mm. Uh, you know, so again, it, it's a crapshoot. Yeah. I love, I love that. That touches on a on a, um, you know, on a message that uh, Kelly Abbey, I don't know if you know Kelly Abbey, she's one of our great choreographers and directors here from Australia. She's done a lot of work over in the States, but I did a live event with her a couple of weeks ago with a whole bunch of dance studio owners, and she was saying she learnt without mirrors. So instead of looking in the mirror and trying to be exactly like that dance teacher, like that choreographer, it, sh- it was just her expressing herself. I love that. You know, in many ways, the mirror is the enemy in a mm. classroom. Mm. Yes, the mirror is there for you to evaluate what you're doing and see where placement should be. However, what happens, it gets to be such a habit. And when a casting call is happening in a dance studio and the table is there, dancers forget. And then they look at, they watch themselves in the mirror when they're performing. Big mistake. Do not do that. When you're performing in front of a mirror, you perform beyond the mirror. You, you perform for a make-believe audience that's way up high there. You do not watch yourself in the mirror. Mm-hmm. It's the kiss of death. Oh, boy. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and I love that because it reminded me of when I had my dance studio, you know, and we started in a little recreational centre with no mirrors. And what we had were, were like glass sliding doors. And I could, put uh-huh. the, I could put the shutters down and we could sometimes see a slight reflection. Like that's all we had sometimes, just a little oh, bit of a reflection. Wow. So we taught, we taught with no mirrors. Um, for about two years in our studio and then we went to a full studio you know that was ours and we had mirrors and all of right, that right. But it was very it was very different and I think the language yes. you know you used I think it made me a much better teacher because I actually had to work out all the different ways to explain 
you know, what, what I was doing and, and what I was teaching. Um, so I, I think I got great, some great skills there as a teacher, not having a mirror to rely on to say, okay, your arm yes. goes here, your head goes here, you know. Well, because you, without the mirror, you're performing. Mm. But if there's a mirror there and you're watching yourself, you are evaluating the way you're moving. And it's inescapable because it's an old habit and it, it will get in your way and you'll come across to the choreographer, oh, that's a classroom dancer. Yeah, that's, totally. That's not what you want. Definitely not. You know, people don't want to pay $130 for a ticket to a show to see a classroom dancer. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you brought up the magic number. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, 100, 130 has been a theme, a theme of our conversation. What, what do you think have been the keys to your success? I mean, you've been one of these, these uh, entrepreneurs, really, who, who created yourself a, an amazing career as a you know, commercial dancer, as a performer. You now run Answers for Dancers, which is predominantly an online business i mean you've had you know you've kind of replicated your success in different ways in the same industry a few times over what what have been the keys to your success and what drives you to continually do and want more you know i i have, i don't have any idea why uh i i just follow my heart yeah i i enjoy what i do i I'll spend 10 hours on the working on the website and I step away from the computer and it feels like 20 minutes. Uh, it, I get, I get, it's rewards me in a way that the time just goes. And, um, uh, I, Clint, I just don't know. It's not for me to decide, you know, I, in, 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 in a way I, I don't want to decide that. That's mm. you know, it's it's like uh, I just I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the next turn on here, not to not to uh, figure out what I did well. Um, it, you know, it's, it's it's I don't know. Um, it, I mean, yes, I am. I feel very rewarded that I see that. Companies have have established what the number one site in educating dance is about the business. Hey, you know, I I started it, but it is it's taking on a life of its own, and I'm not responsible. I'm I don't do it all. I just I've got the platform going, and I'm paying attention to what the kids are doing and what they want and what they're giving to each other. And it's amazing. And it just makes me feel good and proud that I've been somehow part of this industry for 60 friggin' years. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, this year I'm having my 80th birthday. Oh, wow. And, you know, I can't believe it. But uh, it's just, and I'm having a great time, you yeah. know, so. It sounds like it. It sounds like you wake up, it sounds like you wake up every day and you're jazzed, you know, you're excited for, you know, what's ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's drive, you know, what, what, why not? Well, well, yeah, I mean, the other option is not to, and I mean, you know, life short. So uh, I'm always a, a person for taking that ticket, you know, waking up, being grateful that I'm here for another day to make a, a, a bigger difference. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I love your website. I was on there today checking you out. And, you know, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think it's I, it's great that it's there, and uh, you know today is Dance Blast Thursday, and this is the day we send out our weekly uh, uh, e newsletter, uh, which is free for anyone. By the way, all you have to do is go to the site and put put your email address in, and, and you get it for free. Uh, but um, the uh, I guess the Dance Blast Thursday is my way of saying I got I I got to get 
I get to my team before they send <laughs> to read the final version yeah, before they send it exactly, out. Exactly, exactly. You've you've got to go and get it out. Look, Grover, it's been awesome chatting with you. I really appreciate the time that you've taken to share. You know, your sixty years of knowledge. Anytime. Thanks so much, Grover. Take care, and we'll speak to you soon. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Do you have a burning business question for Clint? Are you coming up against a challenge in your studio that you need help with? Go to studiohotseat.com today and record your question for Clint. If you're lucky, Clint will answer your question in an upcoming podcast episode. Get expert help today from someone who works with hundreds of dance studio owners every year. Again, head to studiohotseat.com to record your question for Clint today.